Hello, everybody, and thank, welcome to this governance webinar. Really pleased all of you could register, and thank you for doing so. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our stellar panel with Tamara Box, Rebecca Robbins, and Patrick Dunn. Um, do please ask questions as we go through. And if we could ask you to please put the questions in the Q&A, ideally, so that we can monitor them. Um, and then we'll certainly leave some time at the end. We may answer some as we're going through. We're going to finish very promptly at two o'clock. So I'm going to get it started now. So the first time in history, we have up to five generations at work. Patrick and Rebecca have spent six years researching the topic and working with individuals and organizations to explore how to maximize the dynamics of our gen intergenerational diversity to create more collaborative and competitive organizations, drawing on real life examples. The result is this fascinating book with the green cover, um, which I strongly recommend to you all. And it's so good, it sold out its initial print run within a week of publication. So make sure you get your copy. To help guide Patrick and Rebecca through their discussions, it gives me huge pleasure to introduce Tamara Box. Mm -hmm. Tamara is a market leading financial services advisor, a global business leader and a portfolio non-executive director. She's a partner and immediate past managing partner, EME at Reed Smith LLP. She's a non-executive director on the boards of Interpath Advisory and Hanover Investors, a trustee of the Chartered Management Institute and chair of CMI Women, as well as an advisory board member for FinTech Investor and for Anthropy. She's also the chair of gynecological cancer charity, the Eve Appeal, an advisory board member of charity Their World, an advisory board member of LSE's The Inclusion Initiative and a founding member of the steering committee of the 30% Club. Tamara's twice been named a Financial News 50 Most Influential Lawyers in 2022 and 23 and was Law Firm Leader of the Year, Large Law Firm at the Women and Diversity in Law Awards also in 2023. So she's a bit busy and we're very grateful to her for being here. So I'm going to ask Tamara to briefly introduce Rebecca and Patrick and then get the session over underway. Over to you, Tamara. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, that did seem to go on forever, sorry. Um, it is a real privilege to get to introduce and share this conversation, um, which is sure to be a lively one, uh, but it's with two of my favorite people who also happen to be best-selling authors. So um, really looking forward to this. Let me tell you a little about them um, and it will, it will make my, uh, my CV that Leslie read pale in comparison. Uh, Patrick Dunn, OBE, is a leading expert on boards and on good governance. He's an experienced chair and serial social, social entrepreneur and his executive experience was with Air Products and, and FTSE 100 private equity business 3i Group PLC. He's the author of the award-winning book and go-to for every NED and every executive joining a board, Boards. Um, he's a member of the Higgs Review and a recognized guru of governance. He also heads up the board consultancy Board Delta. He's the chair of the charities The Royal Voluntary Service and ESSA Education Sub-Saharan Africa and a visiting professor with Cranfield University and an associate fellow at Warwick Business School. He was also the founding chair of the EY Foundation and the founder of Warwick in Africa. So also a little bit busy. <laughs> Rebecca Robbins um, is the founder and CEO, or is a founder and CEO working with organizations at the intersection of brand, culture, and leadership. She has over 20 years experience working with leading businesses across the world, such as JLR, Lego, LVMH, and Rebecca teaches on leadership programs at leading business schools and universities, including Cambridge and Oxford, um, and is an advisor at Quilt AI, heralded by The Economist as an AI for good pioneer. She's the author of three best-selling books, including the co-author of the one that we are about to get to discuss today. Um, so as you can see, uh, very, very well uh, experienced to talk about this subject of generations in the workforce. Mm -hmm. So Rebecca and Patrick, we've been hearing about um, differences in the generations and challenges of working with generations in the workforce for some time now, various articles in Harvard Business Review, et cetera. Um, so what, what has caused you to do this now? Why this book? Why now? Um, and, and why this topic for you two with so many things on? <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Tamara, and for the brilliant introductions. And thank you again, Leslie, for having us on today. Uh, 
I, I will kick off with the big why. And I think, Tamara, that that why is so fundamentally important in all the ways in which you've set it up. First of all, we're at an inflection point um, with all the resonance mm -hmm. and implications. We are also at a unique moment in history. And you said that beautifully at the beginning, Leslie, we have five generations at work for the first time in history. And of course, mm -hmm. that will continue to be the case as we are, have aging populations. We're going to want the need to work for longer. And mm -hmm. I think to your point, Tamara, you know, really there was a call to action in us. There was something um, really uh, almost, uh, let, let us say, a calling in the world. Because when we think about the confluence of force factors that are upon us, we are at this inflection point. You know, we have crises raging um, in climate and geopolitics. We have this inflection point in technology and with it all the hopes and fears um, that it brings. And you know, our big proposition was we have a choice. Every single one of us on this call today, and I can see so many joining as we speak, do, do we want to be part of the solution? Do we really want to be part of the solution? And how can we be part of the solution? Because we we know there was a far bigger opportunity um, going on around the generational discourse. And that gets us to the nub of the problem behind that why. The problem is that the world's, and this has been happening in business and society, have been bombarded with entirely the wrong conversation about generations. And by that, we mean, I think, what will resonate with every single person on this call today is ever-decreasing silos and stereotypes around generations. Yeah. And our mission really was to take a global view, first of all. Um, we didn't quite get to seven continents, um, but we got <laughs> to four. Um, and importantly, we unpacked that, that research across business, education, government, and, uh, and social purpose. That was very important to us, really, to to get to to to, to get that specificity, but also that 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 combination of breadth and depth. And of course, what we found in the research, there is so much more, and we'll come on to impact this in more detail. But I just want to land that point early on. There is so much more that we share than than than, than fundamentally we are led to believe that divides us. Right. You know, I think we quote Toni Morrison, the brilliant Toni Morrison, who talks about the meaning behind our human difference in her Nobel uh, lecture speech. And I, I share that because that really captures, I think, the, the, the sense of the, the spirit of the book, which is at the heart of how we better harness our individual and our collective potential. And I hand over to Patrick, but I think there's one quote that we both love, which is um, Einstein's famous prediction that a quantum leap in tech um, would also demand a quantum leap in human relations. So this really is about mm. a quantum leap in human relations and all that it, it can bring. Yeah. And from a commercial point of view, I mean, I, I've always benefited hugely from the wisdom of, of all the generations, not doesn't just belong to the old or the, or the young, all of them. And uh, particularly through EY Foundation, where, you know, this fantastic uh, youth advisory board, the power of young people to uh, challenge, bring fresh insight, you know, inspire really high. And when you looked at what the debate was that was going on, it was all quite negative and quite reductive and quite mm -hmm. divisive. And I was sitting there thinking, well, you know, well, why don't we think about making the most of the different generations and what they bring? Why don't we have a sort of maximizing mindset rather than a sort of whingy mindset? And that, that would actually, and, and then if we could find examples of what people were doing tangibly to bring the generations together, to get the most out of them and share those, uh, that might inspire other people to take a more positive view of some of these generational differences. Oh, I love that. Well, look, we were talking five generations, but actually we can't really talk mm. about that without mm. breaking down a little bit. What do we mean by generations? Oh, yeah. You note in the book, actually, that age is uh, radically over-stereotyped and undervalued. So how do you define generations in the context of that yeah and and also what names do you give do you give uh do you give these different generations well i suppose when we when we look at it and we think about well what is a generation it's normally meant to to be a group of people coming uh to adulthood at about the same time and people mm -hmm. take you know a 15 year or something like that kind of point and if you look at the force factors which define that generation in terms of the way they might think, the way they might behave, the way they see the world. There's clearly what the economic context is will be a driver of that. There's clearly the social and um, cultural context that they are uh, born in. There's the technological environment that they, uh, that they experience as they grow up and, and come to adult. And very tragically and, and sadly and, and you know, enormously in our minds at the moment, there's also conflict. You know, imagine the forces on those young people in the war zones. You know, I won't name them as sadly too many, but you know, how are they going to feel about lots of things as they grow up? They'll have very different perspectives to those of us that have lived in in, in areas of peace, uh, as, as we 
as we were growing up and a child. The second thing is the names that, that, that generations are given are really, they're quite hilarious, really. You know, we have the boomers because there was a baby boom and an economic boom following the Second World War. We have the silent generation just before them. You know, there are still some of those in the, in the workforce who didn't really want to talk about a lot of stuff um, uh, for, for fairly obvious reasons. Then you have, you know, the, the, the Gen X because they didn't want to be defined. <laughs> they were the sort of that, 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 that generation, um, that there may be many Gen Xs on the, on the call. And then you have the, the, the millennials, you know. Uh, now these are, these are Western names, these are Northern names. Actually, when you look at the subject, you find there are other names that people use. So uh, in Vietnam, there's the 9X generation, you know, those young people who came to adulthood after the war and as the economic uh, environment was, was opening up and booming. You have the born free generation in South Africa. You have uh, what's known as the, the 421 generation in China. You know, as a result of the single child policy, you have many uh, uh, now sort of adults who was a single child and you know, with two parents and four grandparents. That's reversing out and now becoming the 421 generation. And those young people are now, you know, they have to look after. Uh, and then there's a very different dynamic, uh, yeah, dynamic nice. there. So generations can mean different things. They can have different names. Those names might evolve. So, you know, the millennials were originally Gen Y and then, you know, um, they, they, they got a different, different tag. So, and, it, and they evolve uh, in, in, in their views. Um, so really interesting topic in, in terms of what is a generation. And uh, Rebecca, just thinking about that, I mean, you know, and picking up on the stereotype point, you know, how are those generations I mean, you're describing, and I think you fantastically do this in the book, the differences across all these different locations. And, you know, Patrick, you just alluded to it, but it, it, then how do we even deal with generations as a concept if the reality is they are quite different? You know, you're a global business. You've got, you know, different stereotypes or at least different generalizations that you make um, based on different locations, et cetera. I mean, how does that impact your definition of what is a generation when we think of those five generations in the workforce and, and most importantly i guess you know how does that lead you on to think about how you tackle the challenges but more importantly think about opportunities with those generations mm, and i love that time that you landed on, on opportunity because that is really what this is about you know we have this extended generational diversity it's only going to continue to go in one direction and so you know already every one of those organizations in the book they're already ahead of the game because you know they've been doing this for the years and they've been wiring it so um i think a couple, a couple of points into this and you know it's consonant with the research that we found in the book and we should also state that you know ai played a really helpful um, part mm -hmm. um in in our research and that research as we said go, goes back the best part of um five plus years um we would also say um because we both love writing um there is not a touch of ai in the writing of the book that's important <laughs> but that was really helpful tamara to your point in understanding ai was great the, the research that we did was fantastic in pulsing a series of um, waves mm. of research and really understanding what were the conversations that were happening what is the discourse um how are people engaging what is on their mind so i think that's a really important point and that types taps into understanding so in terms of as leadership teams uh, how do we understand very well or indeed not our organizations mm. um and i think this, this links in also to there's a we, we quote um Alex Mann at Channel 4 um, in the book. Mm -hmm. Again, she's done mm -hmm. a lot of work around um, yes. uh, younger generations and Gen Z specifically. And there's a quote she says, which is, over we're living in an age of overclassification. It's not really helping any of us. And I think for that, it's, you know, are we looking in a, as much through, actually even more through lenses rather than labels? You know, sort of, so I think that sense of letting go of some of these labels, thinking more through through generational lenses and actually how that hardwires us. Um, so understanding is really where it begins. And there were two common mm -hmm. factors that we found through the research and 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 i think we i really land that point um it really is that compelling um this this this, this really breaks through the sense of you know what people think is wrong uh, with generations what i think is that people think is wrong in business um we have a problem with understanding in a lot of cases and we have a problem with communication and they're eminently solvable if we first of all understand what is going on in our organization so do we for mm. example as people leaders as as hr and and cpos and chros how are we looking at that whole sort of organizational structure in terms of that demographic, number one? Do those um, do those five generations really have a greater understanding of each other and enough understanding? Mm -hmm. um, and with that, then, um, the communication piece, 
you know, internal, external, employer brand, et cetera. Um, because without that, we're really under, under indexing on our ability to maximize our potential in the organization. And of course, what glues all of this together, um, you know, collaboration came out. Um, we did also a lot of work in terms of organizational values. That was also backed up by work at, um, a brilliant work at Oxford Said um, and the Oxford Character Project, that collaboration is the number one um, uh, organizational value in, uh, in, in, many, in many companies. It's certainly in the top five um, in a lot across the world. And to your point, you said the word, the phrase, you use the phrase undervalued. It's it's probably one of the most diluted words in business because we don't exercise it. We don't invest in it. And so what we evidence in the book is actually companies who are really thinking about one, their organizational structure, also bearing in mind that the shape of our career pathways, we're going to have, I think the Drucker Forum just a few months ago um, predicted we're going to have now sort of 20 jobs over seven careers. And that probably, that number has probably gone up since the last time I looked at that data. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'll share one example because uh, as you said, Tamara, you know, a lot of this, 80% of the book is about solutions. We really commit to being part of the solution. And so therefore you can pick up the book. Um, it's not just the what and the why, but it's crucially the how. And I think one of those examples I'll just quickly unpack, which is uh, LVMH um, group. Huge group. They are, um, and, and again, we might say, okay, that's a huge group. Um, they're, they're, they're far bigger maybe than, than one of our organizations. Um, indeed, one of our, the organizations on our call may be, may, may be even bigger. But I cite them because it's a huge global group. They operate across 75 different verticals and business units. And um, there was a fantastic example of an individual in the organization who really wanted to move her career on. And she realized she didn't know enough about what was happening in the rest of the organization. In essence, they were missing at more horizontals and diagonals that connect us. And we know that those horizontals and diagonals are the absolute magic. And so this was one individual who said, well, instead of solving it for myself, surely I can't be the only one in this organization. And she put forward a business case that, again, in collaboration with her people team and, and, um, uh, and leadership at the time, got this signed off and ended up solving that problem for hundreds of thousands in the organization. And she set up a platform called LVMH Dare, which was essentially an entrepreneurial platform mm. designed to exercise that muscle. And I talk a lot about collaborative muscle in the everyday. So bringing together people across the organization who would have never have met, let alone have worked with each other from different cultures, disciplines, levels and backgrounds it's been a highly successful platform um, and again it works because it's 365 it's on the entire year um, knowledge sharing then happens throughout the organization but importantly again this was inspired by one individual um, again so in a really good example of doing fewer things well and sustaining them and it wouldn't happen if someone hadn't listened to a younger right. person and right. it wouldn't happen if you had that you know without that open mind and thinking here's an opportunity not just oh yeah. you know is a, here's an observation from a, a younger manager, which you right. could hear as a, as a whinge, or you could hear as, wow, that's interesting. Uh, you know, why don't we do something about that? And the other fascinating about that example and so many others is a lot of these things don't really cost any money. Uh, they're very, you know, there's no big capital investment. A lot of this is a sort of mind shift and actually just kind of piloting, experimenting, and, and, and so mm. on. So it's a, a great opportunity in that sense as well. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you know, you've picked up on a couple of things here. I think before we go on to, and, and the book fantastically spends all its time on solutions and opportunities, but realistically, you know, we know in the conversations about generations right now, more discussion is had about the challenges um, mm -hmm. than the opportunities. And and I think you do identify the challenges in, in order to start, you know, you've picked up on one, listening to young people and not hearing it as a whinge, you know. Um, let's talk a little bit about those challenges as you saw them and then where, you know, we'll get on to. And I think it'll be really exciting to get a few more examples like the LVMH uh, dare uh, to think about how did people sort of tackle those challenges head on. But as I say, I don't think we can have this conversation without acknowledging what I think not. more people spend time on, which is, oh my God, this is a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, Rebecca said it before, there's, there's fundamentally three categories of challenge. There's understanding each other, there's communicating with each other, and there's actually having this, what I describe as a maximizing mindset. Uh, and actually the latter is probably the biggest <laughs> of, mm. of those things, because if you have that, you will make the effort to understand. You will make the effort to communicate in a, in a different way. And it might not just be you adapting the way that you communicate. It might be actually 
inspiring other groups to communicate in a different way so they can better get the things that they actually want. Um, so on the understanding each other, I think, you know, we, when we, we've both been big fans of, of next gen boards, um, as I think is, is, is well known. Uh, and we found a lot more of those than we thought we were going to mm. over 200 yeah. significant numbers in yeah. very large organizations. And it's very interesting in the early days of setting up a next gen board, there are things to get your head around, you know, how, how many people should the cohort be? How long should this cohort serve for? How do they interact with the, the senior leadership team and the management? Uh, what do we do? You know, we're, we're asking these young people to sort of tell us stuff. What do we do if we don't actually want to do what they, <laughs> what they suggest? So how do we deal with a conflict that emerges from there? So there's lots of challenges as you try and, uh, as you try and do this. But actually, if you come at it from the spec perspective of, you know, this will be better for the business and better for us as individuals, then you can overcome uh, many, of those, uh, many of those challenges. Inevitably in life, you have to, you know, if you've got a conflict situation, that might be a conflict of ideas or a conflict of personalities or a conflict of perspectives, there's only five things you can do. You can compete, you can collaborate, you can accommodate, you can avoid, or you can compromise. And actually in, in changing a culture, to be more sort of intergenerationally adept, if that's an expression, uh, you, you have to do all of those from time to time. You know, you have to be true to your values. So there might be times you have to compete and say, no, no, actually that's not acceptable behavior. That might be what you want to do. It might be what you like doing, but that's not really uh, a good thing in our, in, in our culture. So you may have to change. Uh, but I think that the challenges uh, are really interesting. And the, the best thing actually is to talk about them get them out there mm. talk about them and deal with it and i think at the moment we're in this sort of weird repressive and expressive mode where there's a lot of expression about you know they won't do email or you know they don't want to work mm. these these sorts of things a lot of expression but people are repressing the kind of the the, the bit that says okay why why is that yeah. uh and what will be be a better way and how can we solve that and how can we have a proper conversation? I think a lot of managers sort of will feel uncomfortable having the conversation. Mm. Just in the same way that many people found that discomfort over gender, over race, over other forms of diversity, because this is just another form of diversity, isn't it, really? Yeah, I think that's absolutely clear. I guess some of the, the concerns around, OK, change, that's obviously a con you know, a, a, an uncomfortable position for a lot of people, but also hierarchical businesses, which, you know, we've long talked about in sort of management discussions, maybe not so effective um, anymore. But realistically, that's still a natural business model. I mean, did you see that as a big part of what is being challenged? You know, when we think about um, generations, but also what is challenging, because you still have this sense that there is a linear sort of path. And obviously, naturally in the past, age was a part of that linear path. Yeah, um, I, I think it's, it's so true, Tamara. And I think, again, that's what's so exciting about the examples in the book, they're the antithesis. Mm -hmm of this hierarchy and of course going back to that point of the number of careers and jobs that we might have um they're not going to get you know ever thinner ever more vertical the notion of plural and portfolio portfolio careers as we knew them perhaps sort of 10 15 years ago you know 19 year olds have portfolio careers already yes. um and that's hugely exciting and so again you know we're going to have to think differently about organizational structure which is why you know i talk a lot about horizontals and diagonals because and it's not doing a, another interesting thing about this is and this came out loud and clear in the book. And this wasn't tied to sort of any um, any certain type of um, organization, Tara. But I think the sense of you hear in so much of the research and from so many employees in organizations, um, uh, fatigue over too many projects and initiatives. And that is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And I think part of getting to the understanding, so the big challenges around understanding each other and communicating is giving ourselves the space in organizations to do that. And as a lot of that is denoising. Um, so again, that comes through loud and clear in the, in the examples mm -hmm. of the book. And again, context is so key there because a lot of these projects, initiatives and com commitments, be they ERGs or otherwise employee resource groups, et cetera, 
they were invariably set up with really good intent. Um, mm -hmm. But then COVID hit, right? And so perhaps there was an yeah. accumulator factor. And so I think, again, in organizations, taking a step back and looking at um, what do we have? What is resonating? That's why, to Patrick's point, the Next Generation Board is one good example. Because, again, it's that, that doing fewer things well and sustaining them. Um, mm -hmm. The second point is also around um, where we hear noise in organizations really about a lot of the challenges. And that's interesting about your more hierarchical because you, you see this organizations talk about the extremities is where we have challenges. Yeah. And by the extremities, of course, we mean, you know, young, young, early career starters, you know, and rising yeah. careers, and of course, older employees. And, and and we know, you know, we've all just seen, I'm sure, only a few weeks, weeks ago, said recruiter with, you know, quite, um, quite a uh, distressing, let's say, um, infographic. <laughs> and we're not going to perpetuate one rule that Patrick and I have, we, we do not perpetuate any stereotypes on this call, because we need it's 2024, and we need to end the stereotypes and the clickbait. Um, um, and of course, you know, that, 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 really that really went viral because the mm. whole debate around sort of 50 plus and we are aging like we are going to want and need to work for longer what is interesting let's take that example alone we did a lot of work with family businesses of course they're generational mm. in construct and leading family businesses have so much actually when they're working well that we can learn from and um, the Mars family were wonderful to talk to they were very open in sharing the work that they're doing and two things just to unpack there one they lead their entire business through such an empowering operating model, which is predicated on their five principles. And that runs through their entire organization. It permeates. And one of those five principles is so key, um, not only because it's intrinsic to them, but it's also intrinsic to so much of this dis discussion, which is we need more mutuality in, in our organizations. Mm. And they use, so mutuality is one of their principles. The second point linked to... Um, older employees is they have a very loyal workforce so they have people who've been there for a very long time how does how do they wire that in terms of career pathways and they're doing a lot of very intentional work around recasting roles in the organization how that connects into a more effective knowledge transfer so rather than sometimes this amazing expertise and experience dissipating and that knowledge being lost it's it's really looking in a very intentional way about mm -hmm. how we permeate that through the organization through better cross-generational dialogue um, but also also through looking at uh, shifting people from, again, some of those, um, you know, ever elongated titles, let's say, and going higher and higher and thinner and thinner mm -hmm. and more disconnected from people to yeah. subject matter experts, practice leads. Um, and that's having a brilliant effect. It's reinvigorating th those individuals in a lot of ways. It's giving them a new purpose and their mission. Um, it's also helping to really look at, look at how we better grow and perhaps look at the engine two of our organization. So the benefits, what's brilliant about the sort of five generation uh, thinking approach and that maximizing mindset is it's having those constant benefits for the individual for the collective and for the organization as a whole and and, and part of the understanding is understanding what the demographic of the organization is now and what it's likely to be but the other thing we've done is is look at you know if you look at today and you look at in by 2050 what will be the generational makeup of the workforce uh, right. and this differs continent to continent uh, you know, with Africa being the most dramatically different to everywhere else. But we are going to need, because there will be many older people who will want to work, partly because they have to, uh, possibly because they want to, you know, have a fulfilling uh, purpose, um, and uh, because there'll be demand. Um, and in, the, in Europe, in the US, or the Americas more generally, um, you know, the those and, and parts of Asia, those population pyramids are, are, are becoming like this. In Africa, it's like mm. a natural triangle. Yeah. And, you know, there's that challenge of who are the people who are going to develop, train uh, the, these younger people as they come through in huge, uh, in huge numbers. And, you know, will the makeup of employment be very different, which, you know, it seems likely that that will be the case. So the thinking about solving those and thinking about, well, we've got all these uh, you know, people who are, who are getting older, who have amazing experiences. How can yes. we deploy those in constructive ways, mm -hmm. as opposed to? It was interesting. We we were doing a conversation on a webinar the other day, and someone said, um, "So, so is what you're saying we we should, you know, get rid of all these um, uh, managers of today, so that they make space for the young people?" We say, "No, no, that's absolutely <laughs> not what we're saying. Uh, it's quite interesting." Yeah. yeah. 
but it, it does it does feel very much like a lot of the challenge has to do with this need to change organizational structures and business models that comes mm -hmm. from these demographics mm -hmm. and the more portfolio nature and people leaving you know jobs much more frequently that the longevity of career changing mm -hmm. but i think you're you know you're really coming straight into the what are the opportunities in that um, obviously one of them being, and you hear it all the time when we face a financial crisis or an economic crisis anywhere, suddenly everybody likes the old people that have seen the last one, right? So you want to build on that, um, you know, that sort of generational experience in those circumstances or crises. Well, it, 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 you know, it feels very much in the book that you're leaning into, hey, why wait for a crisis? Why wait for, you know, something to be wrong to build on? you know, that generational and intergenerational dialogue. So let's mm -hmm. talk about some of those opportunities that you identify in the book. And I know you have some wonderful examples of those. Um, so let's let's move into that. And I see we've got a couple questions uh, in the Q&A. We are gonna leave time and we will come to that. I just wanna make sure we get to some of these, um, these fantastic examples of, of the real solutions that uh, the book offers. Yeah, oh, Rebecca, do you wanna go first? Well, well, certainly next generation boards, as Patrick alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that is one of one of the one of the many that, that we unpack and because they work so well across um, any business of any type and any scale. Um, and they take they, they take what is interesting about them. Again, we share there's a common blueprint, you know, in terms of how you can set one up. But the purpose can be very, very different in terms of what an organization is looking to do. And we'll take a couple. I mean, yes, Patrick and I actually um, came together originally over the EY Foundation, which is an mm -hmm. a dedicated education education and social mobility because again you know one of the things that we both give back to is we really are committed to um, uh, education and, and 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 everything that that holds um, the ey foundation really puts young people at the head and the heart um, and that means therefore uh, having not only a youth advisory board from inception but also those young trustees two young trustees around the table and 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 that's an important mm. point to just dwell on for a second because um specifically to make that happen um, we advertise for two young trustees um, um, under a certain age mm -hmm. as soon as they're on the board they are trustees alongside and that's and that's just again a, just a helpful recommendation for anyone looking to do this um, around how we can uh, really start to shift dimensions of diversity because and uh, Tamara and I we've talked about this for years I know with our work on CMI um, and others but we're in 2024 and we still haven't shifted the needle on board diversity well again we're not going to get there unless we start building the talent pipeline today and so next generation boards are brilliant in so many respects one their platforms for cross-generational dialogue hardwired to the leadership team and or to the board depending upon how your organization is structured um, second of all they have a wider halo effect across the entire organization because of course they tend mm. to rotate through cohorts um, they also have a huge uplift um, on on our employer brand and of course as we think about again that board talent pipeline we are building, you know, going back to that point about collaborative muscle, we are genuinely building muscle in, you know, how mm -hmm. to be an effective board member in somebody's 20s and upwards. Um, and developing never thousands be possible of board members. otherwise. Yeah. Sorry, Patrick. I, I, we're, we're developing thousands of board members as a company. We are. We're developing, exactly. Yeah. We're developing thousands of, of, of board members. And I think that's important in the sense that sometimes these things can be seen as for the few, but when you add them up in terms of their cohorts, and when you think about the effect it's having across organizations and then into that board spectrum, it's such a powerful platform. Yeah. And also the other thing that's interesting about next-gen boards is I think traditionally people have thought about next-gen boards as being young people, the next generation of people. Whereas actually some people are thinking about next gen boards in terms of the next generation of the organization. Right. So I, I've helped a number of people set up multi-generational next gen boards. Uh, sure. because they, they're thinking about how can we, you know, how can we make the organization uh, sustainable? Uh, and it's interesting, one of the examples in the book is Hoffman LaRoche, who, you know, uh, Andre Hoffman, the sort of legendary uh, guy who's who's currently the chair there now. Uh, you know, they think in hundred year spans mm. of the organization. So what, in terms of the business, you know, what will be the world population? What will be the demographics? What will be the disease? Yeah. What will be? And then how, how might we manage in that different environment? Some of which you might predict, some of which actually you've got no idea what's going to happen, but you can sort of get ready for different possibilities and it's quite interesting um when, when you start to think mm. in that different way rather than next quarter's earnings 
And I think it's a a great example that Chamra works across both corporate, social purpose, Mm. social innovation. You know, there are great examples in Mm. there, you know, as with Patrick, you know, we we, we both do a lot of work in helping companies set set these things up. And um, the FT is a good example, Pentland Group, which operates across lifestyle and sports, Um, Liberty Global, um, I work with them recently. And, you know, they, what, what is, what is so powerful about this is that, you know, there's a real challenge to um, uh, a question that often comes up, which is, well, isn't it, just doing an, something extra in the organization of course it's not because it comes down to the purpose and invariably every single one of those examples is better collecting the employee experience to the consumer experience and i find that again happy to put that out in terms of you know if you're considering doing that um in the coming months or or indeed the, the, the year coming up um the more that we can couch business cases around how we are connecting that employee experience the consumer experience a lot of organizations that i work with and they say we're suddenly having, um, you know, a, a consumer base that is far younger. <laughs> so our yeah. consumer base is, is is getting younger, but actually our workforce is there's quite a mismatch there. So how do we look at that? Um, and that's a really exciting conversation to have. But of course, there are a lot of implications around that. So it's, that's again where next gen platforms is just one of the many solutions that we can think about. And again, that blueprint is there for you all to. Feel free to borrow. Go and set one up today to <laughs> talk to us. Um, but you know they're 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 great accelerators and amplifiers of, of talent, of rising talent across any organisation, hands down. And that's what's really powerful about them. And the example well, that I- the MH there yeah. earlier is is one one example of another category, which is all around innovation. So mm-hmm. actually, you know, getting people from different generations together around innovation. Uh, is a brilliant thing to do. I mean, you know, one of the other things we've done, which I find really interesting to researchers, you know, when you look at the the founders of companies, legendary companies have sustained, I mean, you know, enormous successes. There's a temptation to think in technology that they're all, you know, mm. young and it's in the garage. Actually, that's not the case. Some of the mm. largest companies founded by people much older, yeah. uh, IBM being one, one example of that. Um, and then, you know, if you look at, um, the auto industry, most of the world's big car companies that have been successful for, you know, whether they will continue to be, were founded by people in the 40s and 50s, not, uh, and the, you look at Siemens, you look at Bosch, you look at, you know, mm-hmm. all these companies, quite interesting. Uh, so when you actually look at it statistically, you know, the, there are stereotypes about these things. When you look at the data, actually, people mm-hmm. of all generations have founded businesses founded organizations at all stages of life you know some teenage some you know quite quite elderly um but we kind of think startups are for young people my favorite one i think is the i think it's one of our top three favorites together actually patrick it's um and i don't know we should have had a prize for who guesses this quickly without looking it up but it says it's the founder the inventor of three light the three light traffic light which was absolutely just brilliant so this is garrett morgan back in the 1920s when he was approaching 60. So just love that story. Just absolutely love that. So looking for the next Garrett Morgan. <laughs> love that. So while we're on next generation boards in particular, we've had a couple of questions come in um, on the Q&A and I think it's probably worth picking up on on two of them right now. One is, you know, how do you deal with, and, and you know, Patrick, I know you have lots of thoughts yeah. of, about conflicts in the boardroom, yeah. but how do you deal with conflict yeah. That's particularly sense. generational conflict, you know, in yeah. in that sort of mixed yeah. generation uh, board environment. So the starting point, I think, is to expect it to happen. Mm. Conflict is inevitable. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, because often it's conflicting ideas, cons- conflicting perspectives that provides the creativity and the yeah. innovation. So yeah. I like, you know, where I'm chair to encourage constructive conflict. Mm. Um, what you have to do, though, is manage what might become destructive conflict so uh and that takes you know obviously some experience some skill but actually i think if you start from the point of view of saying it's okay to have different points of view but at the end of the day we have to align on doing you know something so we have to reach some agreement so you might be chairing a meeting and when i've been doing coaching of next gen chairs you know a lot of that coaching if you if, if in the early days is around how do i manage these differences it's very mm. interesting at the moment. I have a very good friend who's chair of something quite significant, and he's done a great job at diversifying his board. But he, he said to me a couple of months ago, he said, 
but it's getting really hard. We seem to take ages to make decisions because I have to listen to everybody and they're not all saying the same thing. When we were in groupthink mode, it was much quicker, but we did some silly decisions, but now, you know, it just takes longer. So I think there's something around expecting it to happen. And then there's developing the skills to, to manage conflict, uh, no matter which side of that conflict you might be on. Um, and so I think it's investing in development and, and, and training basically to, uh, to do that because there are well-known ways, you know, to, to disagree respectfully, to you know, have very different points of view, but at the end of the day have to compromise on something or you go with one way or the other. But then you, once you've decided, you commit to support that idea. Even if you didn't, yeah. if it was a great idea in the beginning, still commit to make that a success if you can. Yeah. And I think kind of follow up on, on that with uh, conflict, mm -hmm. think about what do we really mean by mixed generation? And, and one of the questions um, from Murray is, you know, if we're talking about next gen boards, what about, you know, boards that actually include older generations on purpose mm -hmm. and, you know, really are trying to pick up on that experience. I think it's it's natural for everyone to think about mm. reciprocal mentoring and the next gen, you know, sort of board or advisory roles, but they aren't always, as I say, until crisis, perhaps, thinking about what are you getting from the, you know, the, the prior generations, those that maybe really have left the workforce, but it still might have lots to offer. Um, what are your views on that? Oh, that's a really interesting one, Tamara, because again, you know, perhaps a few things in answer to that. I mean, first of all, again, family businesses were really helpful. Again, the, I direct everyone to the chapter on family businesses. But there's a lot of interesting work going on there. There's also fascinating insights around what is happening across skipped generations. So, you know, mm. what we hear actually from a number of, of organizations is, you know, you've got millennials rising into the next leadership roles with, you know, a lot of, you know, Gen X, obviously incumbent um, now um, coming on behind, um, you know, still a lot of boomers in, but that sense of tension, where tensions exist, it's often, you know, in those in those cases around um, next level ambitions. Um, what's interesting about came out, in terms of what came out about this very intentional next generation and success session and talent pl um, um, planning work that was going on in some of the family businesses really beautiful conversations around what was happening potentially between grandfather and grandson <laughs> and how that also then correlated yeah. in terms of the business at large so there was a nice mirroring actually of what was happening in the family and the organized and the family per se and the work they were doing on themselves and again how that aligned with what was happening again the whole of the total operating model of the organization so i think that that's one um another one you mentioned mentoring tamara it's really interesting because mm -hmm. we've heard a shift in recent years um and the term re reverse mentoring I think there's something, um, and again, I've, I've embedded this into every next generation board I've set up, which is I talk about mutual mentoring, and it's probably an evolution mm -hmm. of the same thing. But I think that mutuality is really important in the sense that it's all about cross-generational dialogue. It's another reason why um, work from the St. Gallen Symposium. I've worked with them for a number of years and they do amazing work and yeah. founded back in 1969. And we know the unrest that was happening on, on the streets then. And actually they said, again, we're going to take a different view and that's how they were born. So there's, a, I think, again, this sense of uh, how we can better and more intentionally foster cross-generational dialogue. And then to the final point there, Tamara, there's, um, we do a lot on intergenerational alliances and there's some great examples, both from, again, some of the automotives and finance and others, but these were particularly rich, whether it's, BMW and their their um, sort of anti retirement program in a good way, and and they look at unlocking their expertise, but also in in terms of some of the banks and where they again they're really thinking more intentionally about um, what's going to happen in that last decade. Another one is actually the EU Parliament EU Commission. Um, they talk a lot about also which we might just touch on briefly because you and I are very passionate about the role of the manager in organisations for lots of good reasons. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's an area of focus for them, a deep area of focus, because they have a lot of people who don't sort of, you know, who, who for many different reasons, don't get to the, the highest echelons in the organization. They're highly valuable. They don't want to, perhaps don't need to. But they have huge swathes of people. There's immense knowledge and expertise, often then managed by people perhaps from a younger generation. Um, so they are very open about the work that they're doing there. So I think there's a big piece in this. And we touch on mm. the book as well in every conversation, Tamara, which is, you know, we've talked about the accidental manager for years. Yes. Why not think more about the multi-generational manager? Because, again, that manager is the pivotal glue in any organization of any size. We know they've been woefully underinvested in in, in, in many years. Um, so 
so this is a time where when we think about where are the natural connectors, horizontals, you know, catalysts in our mm -hmm. organization, they are one for sure. If we've moved from accidental managers to with no training who haven't been invested in to multi-generational managers, I think there's just so much we can do there. And again, that's evidenced in so many of the examples. There's some really interesting questions here. I, just, I agree. Can, can, can I pick off a couple? You absolutely may, Patrick. I was about to do the same thing. Yeah. So please, you you choose. So uh, Sandra's question. So Sandra's saying, if you can't see the chat, I'm chair of a newly created intergenerational committee at Close Brothers. What advice would you give me to engage our board and fellow employees with our committee? That's a fantastic question, Sandra, because one of the challenges many people have when they set up an external board is that they kind of don't talk, don't want to talk about it too much until it's successful. So they haven't really talked about it or they overhype it. Uh, and that means that people don't have the right expectation of it. What's it for? So when we set up the EY Foundation, Youth Advisory Board, the first cohort, we're on our fifth now, uh, actually the objective was to, to, to learn, to work out what might be a good model for doing this. That was the sort of legacy that that first group left. And they came up with a fantastic way of doing things that we then learned. And we, so we said, you know, to the main board, well, this is, this is the objective of them. They have much bigger objectives, yeah. different objectives now. So I think there's something around setting the expectations with the board and with the fellow employees. One of the groups that's most important to engage with is the executive committee or the senior leadership team or those groups because you know, the board might say, yeah, get set up this next gen board. You know, we want challenge, we want fresh insight. And what do you know? These young people then bring fresh insight and they bring lots of challenge. Yeah. They bring yeah. that to the executive who, who probably got a hazy view about what this might be about. So there's a very large German business I've been helping and you know, we've trained their, both their youth advisory board but, or, or their horizon board, they call it, challenging committee, uh, they call it, but, uh, but also the managers, the execs, on how to deal with these fresh different types of challenges that they might get. Um, the other question from Victoria is, do you think there's a particular need to seek new or yes. different qualities and behaviors in chairs? Uh, I mean, as a chair, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting, um, the night before last, I, I was thinking at dinner of chairs, um, the sort of peer group thing. And, and actually, we were all saying, you know, actually, we need constant development. There's this idea that people seem to have that, you know, by the time you reach a chair, you, you should be able to do everything, know everything, handle every situation. That's not the way life is. And that's not the way humans are. Uh, we constantly need to, to learn, to develop, to adapt. And I, and I think there isn't enough for chairs around at the moment, I think, in terms of that. There are small little clusters of peer group learning, but there needs to be more. Um, and it's not just about this intergenerational thing. I think it's broader, broader than that. Mm. And then yeah. I love uh, I go, go on, Patrick. Oh, sorry, I'm on a roll. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, I, no, that, that's absolutely fine. I, I, please keep going. I, I just, there's some I just great wanna, questions. There's some really great questions. I didn't want to miss something. Um, I think it's really important just to double click on Sandra um, that I wanted to catch that I think is, it, I, I think I want to share it with everyone. I think we don't talk about unlearning enough um, in the process. And uh, and that unlearning is really important because when we think about the problems that we're solving for, and you know, we're not gonna go, it's, it's Wednesday, <laughs> you know, we're either sort of post lunch or wherever we are, we are and what we're doing. I don't wanna go too existential on this, but you know, we when we think about the problems that we're solving for and the opportunity in business and society, they are, it's all at the intersection of things. And so that's why yeah. you know, your work chairing this inter intergenerational committee is so important because again, our organizations are not structured enough at the intersection of things so that's one point and that therefore needs more unlearning when you talk about sort of again engaging the board um there is a lot of again going back to the say do gap there's a lot of um you know appetite and interest in in working with the next generation board i hear that all the time from leadership teams and from boards the reality of what happens when you're when you're when you're putting those those, those, those two things together can be very different so my big thing is also how we link that investment that early investment into unlearning the second point patrick touched on and I just thought Patrick I just want to double click on that because you mentioned the naming 
Um, there is a, there is no um, you know, sort of generic naming approach to this. One of the reasons why, uh, again, Patrick and I came together because we we uh, we saw there wasn't actually sort of a framing for how we think about next generation boards. Um, and frankly, Shadow Board uh, from Harvard Business Review yeah. way back when had been adopted. Um, and it's funny to your point, Patrick, because again, that's one of the things that we united on. Um, I set up also a board called the Horizon Board, and precisely because we should not have anyone sitting in the shadow of, of anyone or anything. And it also suggests passivity. So I just wanted to double click in terms of that around also how we frame the ambition and purpose of our boards. I think it's really helpful and how a language can be just a real friend to us in that process as we're looking at the business case. Damien's got a great question about um, uh, yeah. will will the younger, if the younger people were listening to this conversation, then that hopefully there are some younger people on this conversation. Uh, would they feel, you know, delighted or would they feel relieved or would they feel patronized? Um, <laughs> and, and, and the answer is, Kaylin, you get all of those things um, mm -hmm. and you get the same from an older group uh, too. Interesting, the, the, in the many of the events that we're running, we actually do have, um, uh, you know, uh, people from very different generations on those. There's mm -hmm. one thing um, coming up in, in January where we've got someone you know who's very late uh, later on in their in, in their career and we've got um you know an early 20 something too uh and, and points in the in the middle because we really we you know what we want is to reflect uh what what we're saying in that and and you know you find lots of different reactions from people depending on you know because they because of their experiences people are driven yeah. by their experiences and i think Callie and i again absolutely love 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 that question um I I I would be surprised if 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 other if, if if from an all generation mindset it would be right because we are coming at this from an all generation mindset we are absolutely coming at this mm -hmm. from an all generation mindset um you know we there is I was just doing a, a, a talk the other day and there's a, there's a an upfront slide that um, I often use which actually couches five generation work in the context of other work and that's everything from Roman who is doing work in terms of future generations across to uh, Linda Grattan, Andrew Scott who are doing work in longevity so again what's interesting is that's very real it's very powerful work that is looking at um, very real issues in terms of those those sort of verticals if you will and we see ourselves also as the horizontal i think what we need to be careful is books may be coming into the world that are adding more labels to we, we just don't yeah. need so where where gen z and when gen alpha are talked about as anxious and they are talked about as anxious by by others we need to be i think a little bit careful about this because that's introducing language that um i, I don't think if, if i were gen z i've got a gen alpha niece right um mm -hmm. I, I don't think it, it's helpful in that construct um it's helpful in the sense that there is in good intent behind it but i do think we need this is why i think language and how we talk about things but the most important thing i think is to have the conversation and then our big thing in the book is also the call to action let it let it what will we what will we have changed in three years as a result of you know these kind of conversations that we're having today each going back into organizations or you know um sandra you're you're, you're chairing that intergen committee somebody is going to, to undertake a bit of org change in, in um in their company that is really i think the mission around um if we do need to change something let's just go on and affect that change because there is you know much more exciting work to be done uh, in business yeah I, I actually want to pick up on that a little bit and maybe go back to where we sort of started which is you know, this stereotyping and labeling, which I think is is somewhat picked up in this. And, you know, whether, and we we saw it actually in some CMI research um, that picked up on the multi-generations in the workforce where older generations had no seeming issues with being managed by younger generations, mm -hmm. but younger generations were less comfortable being managed by older generations. And I think there is, you know, a lot of everything you're talking about in that finding really around do younger generations think that older generations have tried to understand their perspectives to are very different and facing a very different world. And, you know, how do you lean into that and maybe think about some solutions and perhaps, you know, for organizations, but also for individuals leading in those organizations, you know, how can they go about trying to get all the generations to feel heard? I think at the core of this is respect. So mm. it's really hard to influence people if they don't respect you. It, it's really hard to get people to do things if they don't respect you. And, and they need to trust you as well. And that's not just trust, you know, what you say is 
you know, your integrity trust, it's competence trust. So some of mm. this, those people will, you know, look at the way many people dismiss older people, they think they can't do tech, when they yep. absolutely can. Uh, uh, you know, pe people will find it difficult in different, different range, but other people will be fantastic at it. You know, equally, you know, young people might not have wisdom. Well, that's nonsense. <laughs> so, so I think actually the way is to, uh, to not try and uh, overthink it, but actually to provide opportunities for people to get to know each other, to, to understand their strengths, understand their vulnerabilities, where they might need some help, some development. And, then, and, and that's what good managers do. Um, you know, I, I was kind of I was a very young manager. I, you know, I, all the people I, I had working uh, in my team were, were, were older than me. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, so what do you do? You know, you, you basically, if you want their respect and you want them to work for you and you want them to do the things that you think need doing, you have to understand what they're really good at. So I remember mm -hmm. sitting down with one, one team, one, you know, just taking over and saying, you know, well, uh, I, I don't know you, you don't know me. But it'd be great to just understand, you know, what you love doing and what you're, what you're really good at and, you know, and all of that. And, you, you know, sometimes people might over <laughs> overemphasize what they're good at uh, or underemphasize what they're good at mm -hmm. you have to calibrate that. But once you know that, then you start to give people the role and say, well, actually, you know, you're really good at this. You want to be really good at this. Why don't you help them learn that yeah. stuff? And, and so mm. I, I think often we try and overthink things and we try and put unnecessary structures and unnecessary complexity in place when it's fundamentally about understanding each other, listening to each other, understanding what we're good at, what we like doing, uh, what needs doing, um, and then getting it done with the best team for the job that you can compose from that different mm. cocktail that you have uh, mm. of, of ingredients available. And I think just one thing yeah. to build on that, I know we're coming to time, Tamara, but I just, there's a phrase that's been used in many cultures over the years to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes mm -hmm. and to walk in somebody else's footsteps. And again, mm -hmm. to Patrick's point, it really is as simple as that. But again, we need to be, there needs to be a shift in, in, in our mindsets and in our organizations from less attention and busyness and sort of over complexity to much more intentionality. And, and I'll, I'll just close out with a quote that I love as, uh, as you know, Tamara, I do, I love, love my quotes, but there's a beautiful quote um, in the book from Anne Carlson. And she says, to stay human is to break a limitation. And I think that's a interesting one perhaps for us to reflect, reflect on um, into, the, into the rest of the afternoon. Agreed. Well, look, as we do have a couple minutes here, I'm going to ask, um, it, in addition to obviously go read the book, because it has wonderful pieces of um, advice and, uh, you know, and suggestions for organizations. You mentioned a call to action, Rebecca. So I'm going to ask each of you to give our audience your call to action um, as we close out. Patrick, you want to? <laughs> I, I, my, my call to action is, you know, think. Uh, think about the organization you've got, think about the organization you want, think about the incredible array of talents you've got across those different generations and turn after you've thunk, uh, act. That would be it. I'm going to build on that with uh, collaborate. Um, I, 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 there's a lot that we unpack in the book and the, all the research, which is around the mindset of collaborative leadership, um, which uh, is so valuable and so important for the context of our times. Lena there's talking about that as Chanel now, connecting into mm. collective intelligence. Margaret Heffernan has talked for a long time about how we need to break away from these so-called hero models of leadership to uh, something inherently more sustainable. So for me, it's that collaborate, collaborative leadership connected to collective intelligence. I love that. Well, thank you both. It's been a fantastic discussion, which I suspect we could carry on for at least another hour. Um, but we, uh, we're we really grateful for the audience uh, having joined us and for the great questions. Thank you very mm. much. Phenomenal questions. Yeah. Absolutely. And thanks thank so much you. to you, Tamara. Yes, thanks all, all three of you. That was just absolutely fascinating. Um, and just so grateful to you for giving up your time and for you two writing that bloody great book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it so thank you so much um i hope everyone else has enjoyed that as much as i have and um we'll see you next time thank you so much leslie thanks bye bye, bye everyone bye everyone